The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. Lean in and listen. You are now experiencing Limitless. Here's your host, Michelle Lena. Lean in and listen with me. Hi, I'm Michelle Lena. Welcome to Limitless. Today's episode is a gripping episode. Oh my goodness, this has so many twists and turns. If you can relate or have experienced or wonder about infertility, adoption, foster care, having children, losing a child, and welcoming in bonus children into your life, how we create a home, what makes a home, and what is the most important ingredient or tool or word to have to create your home. You're going to find out what that is on today's episode. And I would like to introduce my guest today, my friend of a very long time. She's a dear friend of mine. Her name is Natalie Welch, and she is a Midwest girl at heart, a mother of many, a stepmother, foster care, adopted, biological and a grandma. She is a health enthusiast, an entrepreneur, a believer in miracles. Can we all just have that title and own that? Let me say that again, a believer in miracles and listening to the universe. In this episode, we're going to talk about how important it is to listen to the universe, follow whatever you believe that higher power, God, the energies, because it is definitely going to help you see life and guide you on a path that might be unexpected. Currently, she is on a journey of reinventing her life and making space for intentional living. Yes, live with true intent and intentional living for her family, redefining what is really important and how to foster an environment that they can all thrive, grow, and heal in. And how mindful it is that as you create your family, that you really do want to foster an environment that you can thrive, that you can also heal in. Please, please welcome my friend Natalie into the studio as we touch base on all of these really vulnerable, tender, subjects of becoming a mother and creating a home. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, sweet girl. Welcome to your first podcast. Natalie, congratulations on being a virgin again. I bet you didn't think that was going to happen today. (laughs) This is your first podcast. So thanks for being on my show. I feel so blessed. Thank you for inviting me. (laughs) Well, the reason why I wanted you on the show is because we, as friends, even though we have an age gap of a few years, many years, we have so many things in common. So many things in common. And I really want to talk about all the things that we have in common, because I think in society, we, we create gaps instead of things that bring us together. And we should get rid of things that separate us. Like, oh, I can't be friends because she's so much older, but, and I can't be friends because she's so much younger, but really our experiences align so well. And you are a beautiful friend and a beautiful treasure in my life. And I just love that it doesn't matter what age we are. We have so many things that we can relate on. So I would like to just talk about that. Let's start with kids, children. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How many kids do you have? Because in your bio, you didn't list the number. So how many kids are you claiming there, Nat? So uh, the short answer would be almost 12. Almost The long answer would be I have six bonus kids that I've helped raise the last 13 years. Um, I have a baby in heaven who would be eight. Um, I have two adopted children and 
two biological and one in the oven due November 7th. So that would make a solid 12 for us. <laughs> you are really working on the dozen. Do, are, are you going to do a dirty dozen? Or is there one more after this? Or are you done now? <laughs> no. We're I think this up. is it. We have... Um, we have a grandbaby on the way and my stepdaughter just got married and has three little boys now. Her husband had three sons and she is mom to those boys. And so I am a grandma. I think it's safe to say <laughs> no, no, that that would make you a grandma bonus kids. Yeah. As you know, they count because you nurture them and you love them. And once they enter into your home and you and your sweet husband have created a home. So these children are yours. And that's yes, something that I, I really, really talk about. So lots of different ways of getting children, Nat, lots of different yeah. ways. So when you think about your journey, becoming a mother and having your kids show up in almost every different way that you can think of having a child, I think you've checked every single box pretty much what would you say to somebody who because i know i get this question it's like which one are yours do you get that question you have never gotten that question or yeah you have um maybe not that question specifically but like i don't know i have people say things like well your kids meaning like my babies or mm -hmm. Um, like, do you love your adopted kids differently than your biological children or do you, or your stepchildren different than your babies? So I get like a range of questions around that. Um, to me, love is love and nurturing someone is a form of love and, um, I don't like, I don't look at like my stepchildren or my adopted children. I don't look at them in categories. They're just my kids. It's all the same. My love is the same. And I don't, you know, they all have different personalities and we have different dynamics in our relationships, but um, they're my kids. So I I love that you said it's, it's it's that simple though. It's love is love. I get that question. Yep. Well, you adopted these children and so you didn't give birth to them. Do they, like you said, with your bonus kids or your stepkids, do you love them differently? And the answer when you break it down is no, because of what you said, love is love. And when you take that label and just honor what that is, that energy, that flow, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No. And I think people who haven't adopted or haven't gotten children through foster care or struggled with having children or have stepkids, unless you claim that, I, I think for me and maybe you can, you know, I'm just entering into the world of being a, a stepmom and a bonus mom. But I just don't see a difference. It's maybe a relationship you have to work a little bit harder because you weren't there from yeah. the very beginning. But right, it, it really is as simple as love. Right. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. It's interesting because I started my motherhood journey as a stepmom. And so we kind of have different like reversed experiences as far as our timelines. But um yeah, I would say like to what you said with your stepchildren, your bonus kids, however you want to describe them, um, you have to earn trust and it takes time. And especially when you're dealing with multiple children, it's all on a different time frame. They're all different personalities, different experiences. Some you click with faster than others. Some takes years to get there. Um, but, and with your babies that you have since birth, adopted or biological, they grow to trust you from the very beginning because you nurture them, you give them every, you fulfill every need that they have. 
And so you're their whole world as little children. Like my kids right now, they're six, six, five, and almost two. And right now their world revolves around mom. Yes. And they trust everything I say. And, you know, I have that trust with them. But with your bonus kids, you really have to be patient and earn it through consistency and grace and uh, like removing yourself from the situation, seeing them for who they are, what came before them, honoring that and knowing that um, you came after all that. So it's a journey and it's been unique with each of my bonus children, but beautiful and fulfilling. And I love every single one of them. So I, I think your journey through being a bonus mom, and I like that term way better. I think the words we use to describe a situation puts a lot of weight in our brain. And if we use certain words, it opens up a different spot. So I like bonus mom. These are bonus kids and anything bonus extra is a blessing. But when you were talking, it reminded me similar to my kids that I adopted later in life, really understanding that they had a whole story, a whole yeah. adventure, a whole journey. And there was probably some really beautiful parts to it, but there was probably some really painful parts to it. And they're little. And so they're still navigating. And maybe they didn't learn from their past um, parent or whoever was in charge of them, their guardian, to teach them trust and to give them grace and to help them learn what love is. And so when we get these kids through either adoption or, you know, we fall in love with somebody and they already have children, we need, I love that you're like, we need to give them grace. They have this beautiful story. And stories are laced with everything from overjoy to overwhelming to hard to sad to every experience because we're humans and they're little and they still go through all of those. So, yeah, it is definitely being mindful yep. that they're individuals and that you're going to connect with them individually on their time. And what we need to do yes. as bonus parents or adoptive parents, because some of my kids came at different ages, 5, 11 um, even like 17 and my oldest, we adopted when he was an adult, he was 30 when we finally finalized his. So yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a journey taking care of humans. It is a labor of love yeah. <laughs> as don't go into labor though, right now. Yes. Okay. Just because I say the words. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, when you think back on motherhood, you started with your stepkids but then you really had, I know, a strong desire to create your family. And I don't want to use that term because you already have one, but there is, there is something about growing a life inside of you. And that's something that you wanted to choose and that you wanted to explore. So let's talk a little bit about that because I know a lot of people have dealt with infertility. And that's something you struggled yeah. with. So yeah. when you say yeah. that word, I know that hits a lot of spots in your heart. So <laughs> I'm just going to yeah. open up that space. It does. I think we need to honor that space. Okay. People have gone there. So let's talk a little bit about infertility and what that looked like personally okay. for you. So, uh, so when my husband and I were getting pretty serious, you know, one of the things that I told him was, you know, I know you have six <laughs> kids that I love and adore, um, you know, but I was still pretty young at the time. And I, I really wanted that opportunity to grow a child and experience motherhood from the beginning. Um, so, you know, I'd hoped maybe we could have a couple. <laughs> And he said, I'll have six more if you want. If you are willing to step into my six, you know, however many you want to have. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I don't know. I don't know about that. But here we are about to have six of our own together. So. Oh, my gosh. Um, anyway, 
so after a little bit of time being married and just getting into the flow of blending our family, um, really wanting to spend some time with the older kids and just give them that attention. They, at the time, uh, when I met him, they were five to 14. When we got married, they were like seven to 16. So they were getting older and more independent and in school all day. And so um, we were ready to start trying and we tried and we tried and we tried. And after a little over a year and several negative pregnancy tests, uh, we sought some help from a fertility specialist um, and started with kind of a smaller less invasive clinic, not an in vitro clinic. Um, we started with, gosh, I, it's been so long, like to remember all the little medical terms of all the like medicines, but we just started with like some timed cycles with some pills to release my eggs. Um, and then we, that wasn't working. So we went to IUI, which is artificial insemination. I think we did that four times. And Four times. never got pregnant doing that. Um, and that one's interesting because they, they get your body to produce several eggs at once. There was one month where I was going to release seven eggs. So I was bracing myself for multiples, but I didn't even get pregnant from that. So we decided to move forward with in vitro. We started the journey of in vitro um, and went to a clinic up in Salt Lake. We live in Southern Utah and started that and ended up with 17 embryos. And I was 27 at the time I was younger. So it didn't feel necessary to spend the extra money on doing all the genetic testing. So we thought we'd take our chances. And um, so we, we did two embryos and I got pregnant. Um, with our daughter Blythe. And that was our first shot at in vitro. It was successful. Um, and as we went through the pregnancy, things looked great. She seemed to be developing normally. I was feeling good. Um, and then we were coming up on our anatomy scan just a few days before I started bleeding. And we kind of like went through the night to see what kind of what came of it. I was in communication with my doctor and he said to come in in the morning if things hadn't stopped. Um, I could feel her moving at this point. So I knew that she was alive. Um, Let we me went to labor and delivery the next morning. Let me pause you right there, Nat. Ooh. Yeah. You went through this whole process. You finally get the news you're pregnant. You're carrying this beautiful little girl, boy. Yeah. How far along are you? Um, just to give a time frame. Yeah. So at this point, I was about 19 weeks 19. when I started bleeding. Okay. Yep. So at the halfway part of pregnancy, pretty much, for those who aren't familiar with pregnancy timelines. Um, so you're usually pregnant about 40 weeks. So. So we're, we're halfway there. At this point, she has eyelashes, fingernails, 10 fingers and toes. You know, she's got all her parts. <laughs> yes. So we go to labor and delivery and they pull out the ultrasound. She has a heartbeat. So I'm relieved thinking, okay, everything's fine. Um, but as they look more closely, there is no more amniotic fluid. And so... They, there were two thoughts on that. It was either my water had broke, which I didn't think that it had, um, or her kidneys were failing and her body couldn't circulate the amniotic fluid properly. So they sent us to a neonatologist, had a bunch of specialists jump on board. I was just, my mind was racing. There was talk of if it's not the kidney problem and it's just the amniotic fluid, we might be able to remedy the situation for just to get her to like viability yes. and have a very premature baby. And so I was hanging on to that hope. Um, 
that that was best case scenario. So then as they look more closely at her developing organs, come to find out her, both her kidneys are cystic and because her kidneys aren't functioning, her bladder is not functioning. Her lungs are compromised. Her heart is comp. Everything is compromised because if one major organ isn't working or the two kidneys in this matter, um, everything else, you know, it's such a delicate, um, my dogs are barking. Sorry about that. Such a delicate, um, situation as babies are developing. So anyway, um, I wonder if they're going to stop barking. I wonder if my pool guy's back there. That's okay. That's real life. Either we can <laughs> edit it out. So or it's just fine. So carry on. This is, this is an okay, important story. I'll continue. Can you yeah. hear them? Is it bothering you? No. Okay. So anyway, we realize everything is failing in this little body of hers. And you know, they start talking about terminating my pregnancy. And I never thought I'd ever have to even consider that option. You know, you don't think about like, when you think of terminating a pregnancy, you don't necessarily think of someone who wanted a baby so bad, who's desperately wanting to be a mother. You don't think of someone like that. Um, so I, in my mind, I'm like, well, no, that's not an option. Even if she's not going to survive, I will carry her until God decides it's time for her to come or until my body goes into labor on its own because I will not choose to terminate pregnancy. But then as they continue to look at my anatomy and my uterus and everything, the placenta is actually completely covering my cervix. The term for that is a complete previa. And that was the cause of my bleeding. And so the risk with a complete previa is you can bleed out and die. So the neonatologist, he was so kind and he just held my hand and looked at me and like kind of explained the seriousness of the matter that no matter what happened, this baby would not survive and um, that if I continued to carry her, my, my placenta would basically rupture or I, would, I could bleed out in the night and not wake up. So I... Um, was in shock, I think, for a little bit. And he gave us, you know, I think let's, let's send you home for the night, monitor your bleeding, go home, talk about it with your family, religious leaders, whoever you need to talk to, therapist, to decide what to do. So I had them reach out to like four other neonatologists across the nation because I needed, I needed like, to be sure, you know, you think I'd hoped to come back in the next morning and for some sort of miracle that suddenly she'd been healed and everything was fine because you hear stories like that, you know? Yes. So, um, but that wasn't our story. So we had to, we had to go in and make that hard decision. And I had to sign pregnancy termination papers and just me. My husband doesn't have to do that because it's not his body. So um, that was really like my doctor, she had to say like, this isn't that. I mean, it is that, but it's not in that way. Like, don't let that, don't let that get in your head. Don't, you know, but it, it did. And I think in like the, uh, strict religion that I've been raised in, it's been pounded into my head that that's one of the absolute worst sins. And so I'm just struggling with all this like morality of this choice and, 
and should I sacrifice myself and not do this and just see what happens? So it's just a lot. I think I battled that for a few years of just like wrapping my head around it. But so we moved forward with the week and mm-hmm. and we planned her funeral and we bought her a grave and then bought ourselves grave plots next to her because as soon as you bury your child, you're you realize I don't want them to be alone. And you start thinking, where do I want to be buried when I'm when I'm gone? So at 27 years old, I'm buying my baby's grave plot and one for myself and my husband. And so that was interesting. And at the time, I could feel her moving inside me as we're purchasing her grave plot. And we went to the hospital at the end of the week and continued with the procedure. And they they ended up inducing me. I was able to have a vaginal birth, which was kind of a miracle considering my previa. They were monitoring it. They had a whole game plan with their medical team. They had blood ready to go to give me transfusions. And I had to sign papers that gave them permission to give me hysterectomy if it came to that. Because with the previa, there was just like a lot of complications that could have happened. So a lot of layers. Um, I was in labor for 24 hours. And she was born. And she was beautiful. And she was perfect. She was, um, I think she had passed just before she was born. They unplugged the monitor because they didn't want me to hear when her heartbeat stopped. Yes. So, but we got to hold her and they put us back in the quiet room in the corner where they put the moms who lose their babies away from all the other moms and crying babies. And we spent the whole day just holding her and loving her and taking pictures and like just like really surreal because you're it's not how you picture having your first baby sorry and you think she's so perfect and beautiful and you see yourself in her and you see your kids I could see likenesses to my bonus kids in her and then to have to leave her and walk out of the hospital with empty arms and a box of memories that they give you. So, um, anyway, so we had her funeral a couple days later and it was just really intimate with family and a few close friends. And, um, then we just kept trying with in vitro. We, we still had embryos and tried to move forward through our grief and, just hoped to get a baby. So we just kept trying and we ended up doing four more rounds of in vitro. Let me pause and you right there. We lost that. three. Let me pause you yeah. right because I think we, I, I, I got to experience a lot of that with you. Uh, and mm-hmm. it was a sacred journey that I got to walk with you down this path when you got pregnant, during your pregnancy the week leading up to going to the hospital, the struggle with that piece of paper and the language they use on that piece of paper and how we're talking about this, how strong words are and how they program our society and how they program our brain and how we're programmed through a religion. And now you have to sign a piece of paper that goes against everything that your value system was built on. And I think we need to really sit with that because we have this word when we end a pregnancy that it doesn't look like this. And this isn't something that a lot of women choose. Now, some people do choose that and and, and they're mindful and that is their choice. But a lot of women are in this position that you are in and we don't have a voice. There's not a word for it. There's not a term that accurately describes the pain that I saw you go through, the pain that I went through just being your friend. Like there was no word that's written out that explains what it is that you had to sign. And um, yes, it was your body, so you had to sign it, but it's crazy that the father didn't have to give permission about, you know, making this decision 
with your child because it's 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 both of you. And then right this beautiful experience um, of being at the hospital and and meeting Blythe and being there for your family and then attending the funeral. There's so many layers to that. When you put a child that was in your womb, in your heart, and now you're placing that child in the earth, that's big. And you're 27 years old and you have six other kids that are experiencing this too. And so I know there was so many layers to that. And so anyone who's walked a similar path, this is your time to have a voice. You are not yeah. alone. Other people have lived through this extremely, look, I got dogs too, tender time. And, and then I think you book ended it really well. You're 27 and you and your husband are buying plots, end of life plots. Yeah. Um, and that is such a surreal moment. Um, and I know that she has played a beautiful part in your life. I mean, in that moment, we don't think about eight years from now and how this beautiful little girl is going to be so active in your life. So yes, your, your um, infertility journey carried on, but let's just talk about how is Blythe showing up in your life? How is this little angel present? What kind of relationship do you have with your daughter? Because I think that's important that people who lose a child and who go through this intense season of grief, how do you still have a relationship with this person that doesn't physically live here with you? Yeah. So that has been an interesting journey. Um, I think initially I... I was so scared I was going to like forget her or I would, I remember just like opening her box and like the little gown that she wore and just smelling it. Like it still, it still smells like her. I keep it in a Ziploc bag and looking at pictures and studying her face, like, cause I could never just see her again. And I was so worried over time that I'd forget her or forget that she existed or that my love for her would um, go away. And even like a guilt from like having more children, like am I replacing her? Like it's just very complicated feelings. Um, lots of that and lots of like trying to be strong for the kids that are here with me that also that lost a sister and you know, they're looking to me and their dad for, stability and comfort and trying to grieve also separately as husband and wife different paths for grieving yes and just there's a lot to like navigate through and and also trying to like be her mother and to like mother my child who isn't physically here with me Ooh, that's so a it's been statement. That's a yeah. strong statement. You still have the privilege to mother your child who is not physically here with you. Right. Wow. Yeah. And so it's been an interesting journey. I think like saying goodbye to her, releasing balloons. We all tossed a pink flower in her grave and just watching them lower her into the ground and like, I remember one of the, the first time it rained, it doesn't rain much here in the desert. The first time it rained after she passed, things come up that you don't really think are going to like trigger you. Like I just remember one night there was a thunderstorm and it was raining and I, I couldn't sleep. And I like, I had to like go to her grave and like cover the grass that she was buried beneath because my baby's in the rain. <laughs> like, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but no. it's just like, and it was shortly after she passed and just like that motherly instinct to like love and protect your baby that isn't here. And I, and I yeah. had breast milk after she was born that took weeks to dry up and, 
you know, my body thinks I have this baby to care for. Yes. But my mind knows she's not here. So, um, so that, and, and there's just been times like over time when I've gone to her grave and just felt like, I don't know, like a presence or a peace or seen like a double rainbow. Um, I, we don't see a lot of ladybugs here where we live. Um, there's a lot of like, it's just desert. A lot of people have turf. Ladybugs thrive in luscious, like green gardens. <laughs> um, but there have been multiple times that I go to her grave and a ladybug shows up. And it doesn't in other places. Um, and over time, it has become something that shows up when I'm talking about her or thinking of her in different places while I'm traveling or um, going through something. I feel like she kind of shows up as a ladybug. Like, I know it's not her, but it's this ladybug. And I, I feel that it's like a sign um, of her love and her presence and her like, mom, I'm here. Mom, it's okay. Mom, I'm okay. <laughs> no, so, I think um, it absolutely is her. I, I, yeah. I believe that we are made up of energy. And energy is never, it's always been. So it's a forever substance. And it just changes form. So it does not, it does not die. It only transforms. And nature is so in tune with energy and so she just lives in a different form of energy that we as humans cannot touch, taste, see, understand. But nature is so in tune with those frequencies that they show mm -hmm. up. And it's not yeah. the essence of, you know, she's not in that ladybug, but she is definitely influencing those things that yeah. listen to those energetics and aligning yeah. them in a space because it's not a coincidence when you're talking about her or you're asking guidance and here comes an angel number or a sign or a ladybug. She's very present and mindful and they're very clever that these little souls that live on the other side on how they communicate with us. Whether we are open to see it or not, that's our choice. But I know you and I have talked about this and since the passing of my mother, and my and my father and some other close friends, I see them now where before, because of religion, I didn't see them as clearly, but they are super right. present. Yep. When you kind of open up that um, realm of just thinking differently and um, trusting your intuition, I feel like you are open to so many things that the universe is trying to tell you. So I've felt that throughout the years, I think, um, since she passed and before even I was her mom, but, um, especially since she passed and especially I feel like in the last couple of years. Um, but as far as like, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, in regards to mothering her or, the journey of my relationship with my daughter who is not here with me. Um, I think since having children, um, to see how yeah. like intricately that all happened with adoptions and the babies yeah. that we physically had, um, there's no doubt that like there was a reason and a purpose for the timeline and everything that happened with her. Um, now that I have biological children, like I see her in their faces and in all my children, I like, I hear her in their laughter. And especially since having my daughter, who's almost two, um, my biological daughter, there was always like a wonder of like, what would she look like? What would her personality be like? And I know sisters can be so different, but at least it sort of gives me some imagination of, who she might have been and I think I've never felt I think before I had babies I I felt close to her at her grave 
And now since having children, I feel closer to her interacting with my children in a moment Aww. or in nature than I do when I'm physically at her grave. So it's been interesting, but that's a beautiful transition. Yeah. That's a beautiful transition yeah. because I have seen since her crossing the domino effect of all of these other beautiful children entering in your life. So your oldest is seven and yep, he'll be seven in November. And let's just tell a little bit about his story because you went through this whole infertility. You went through several more rounds um, with failure, success, and yep. then you and then you landed with this unexpected little miracle, your your little seven year old son. And how did he his yep. journey is interesting too. How did you end up with this beautiful little boy? Yeah, so we um adoption was never something I was against, but I was maybe afraid of it because sometimes it doesn't work out and I couldn't prepare my heart for another loss. Yes. And we were really tapped out financially and adoption can be expensive. So a friend of ours came to us and they knew of these two children. It was a three-year-old little girl and a 10 month old baby boy, her brother that were needing to be adopted. They were in the care of their grandmother at the time. And she was in communication with us in the state and the goal was to become foster care licensed so we could pursue adopting them. And so we didn't want to waste any time and we jumped on that bandwagon and we took the classes as fast as we possibly could and got licensed within like six weeks, which is really fast wow. for foster care licensing. That is fast. Um, did all the background checks, the home studies and, um, their dad, the son of this grandmother, ended up getting his act together in that time to where he wanted to have his kids and, and he was able to get them back. So, of course, we're happy for him and for them that he came to that place. But it was like a little disappointing and confusing. Um, like, why did we just do all that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and this was just the reason why I didn't want to pursue adoption because of more loss. And anyway, so we kind of took that as a sign of like, okay, maybe that was just a push we needed because we were supposed to be doing foster care. And so here we are licensed. Let's just keep our license active and open and just see what happens. So a few months passed and we didn't get a call and kind of feeling discouraged. Um, and then it was like the week of our baby's um, of Blythe's headstone was being delivered and placed. And it was like the week of Thanksgiving. All my family was coming in town. Her headstone was being placed. I was excited to finally have something for her grave, but like lots of feelings around that. And um, we got a call from one of the ladies at DCFS and she said, there's a baby boy in the NICU ready to go home and he needs a home. Do you want to be his home? <laughs> so I remember I was driving in the car, picking up my, my bonus kids from all their things. And I like made a U-turn. I had my youngest stepdaughter in the car with me and she just wanted to be a big sister so bad. <laughs> so she knew before her dad even knew. And I said, yes, like no questions asked. I don't, I don't even care what the story is. I mean, I, I just, yes, like I don't want to waste any time of him not being in someone's arms. So yes. her and I go to Target. We're just throwing all the baby stuff in the cart for baby boys, getting every, all the, all the necessities. And within two hours, my husband and I were standing in the NICU holding this tiny six day old baby boy. Um, wow. And they did the whole walkthrough, you know, safety, everything with us in the car seat check. And they unhooked him from all the wires and the oxygen. And I just remember like, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> you guys are just going to let me walk out with this baby? Like, <laughs> it 
it's kind of shocking, I think, when that happens and when you've wanted it for so bad or for so long and then it just happens like that. It's just like a whirlwind. But we brought him home and and I just remember staring at him all night long, just like, is, is he breathing? Is he like, okay, <laughs> I'm a new mom. Like, just so many things. Um, and we didn't know what was going to unfold with him. The goal, I think, initially was reunification with the family. And so we knew that going into it. Um, and there's a lot of complicated feelings with that. That could be a whole podcast episode. <laughs> Yeah, yes. but um, just like you love this baby and you want to protect them, especially when you've had, you've been waiting for so long to have a baby and now you have one, but because you have this pure love for this baby, you also have a love for the family they came from, despite the circumstances and you want what's best for them, whether that's you or them. And so I think it was a humbling experience for me because I went through this maybe initially being like a little judgmental of the situation. And as I grew to love him and love them as time unfolded, just having nothing but love and compassion and wanting the absolute best for this family, whatever that looked like, whether I was in the picture or not. So that was kind of a like interesting place to be. Um, so there was probably eight months that things were up in the air with him before things were like determined that he was going to be adopted. And the birth mom actually chose that for him. And I think as she got to know us over time and she could see that we did love him and we, you know, we were all that he really knew. Yeah. And I think she didn't want to disrupt his bonding. And so, um, she chose us to be his parents, which I felt so honored. And I think that it's the best thing that could have happened for her and for him and for us, that that was a choice that she was able to make. So again, um, I really respect her for that. Absolutely. Um, I think what it goes back to what you said at the beginning, it's just love. And we don't, take time to really think in this situation and i'm glad that you came around near the end like this is an eight month journey this is very emotional you don't know where it's going to land but in the end what's best for this child is that reuniting with the biological parents or is it continuing in this environment where he has grown attachments and there's stability and there's this loving nurturing environment and I, I think when it comes down to you as parents bringing this child and create a home, and I love that, like, do you, home is such a powerful word. It's so powerful. He needs a home. Well, we're going to bring him home. And what does that mean? It's just this beautiful place where love grows. And I just think that whole story is just every layer from the birth mom to the hospital to what you guys created and then her final choice it is the ultimate gift. I mean, having an adopted child, I have so much respect for my birth mothers. That is a gift that I'm going to cry that you just can't even explain because it's life and you're and you walk out of this hospital with this life with so much potential and possibility. And then for this brave, brave mother to go, no, I choose you. It's, 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 it's so my brain can't even wrap around that concept. It is the most selfless gift a person can do is to choose their child um, before themselves. Yeah. And I think it's just selfless. Yeah birth mothers are just incredible and they don't get enough credit. So if you're a birth mother and you're listening, I honor you and I respect you. And I know you do the same thing with your birth mothers. Um, you have another daughter that come from not foster care, but um, your second child, living child yeah. um, was adoption too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. It's 
yeah. Do you want me to like pick up from that or where do you yes. want me to go with that? Yeah, no, kind of. Yeah. Let's, so let's wrap that up and then, and, and segue into your, your sec, your third child that my that yeah. you got okay. experience from birth. Yeah. So, so my son was three months old when we got a call from my daughter's birth mother. And at the time, like I said, it was like an eight month journey before knowing what his permanency was going to be. So we were still in that limbo with him. And of course, like hoping selfishly I could be his mom forever, but also just hoping for the best for him, whatever that was. So um, I just remember like, sorry to jump back to that, but like every court date, every team meeting, every meeting with the social worker, like every milestone and progress that this family made, I had nothing but like joy and celebration and like, yay, I'm so proud of you feelings. It wasn't like, oh no, they're going to get him back. It was like, yes, you're doing it. Like yes. nothing but love and joy for their growth so That's it's just like it's just such a like complicated layers of <laughs> feelings <laughs> all coming from love right yeah so so he's three months old and we're in this space of limbo not knowing what was going to happen and my daughter um her birth mom called me and she had heard of us by word of mouth. We were on no waiting list. There was no agency we were talking to. It was literally just word of mouth. Um, I've been pretty open like on social media with my infertility and adoption journey. So I think people just sort of knew. And this lady had been, a friend of mine had been talking to a coworker about it. And her coworkers aunt was best friends with this birth mom who lived in like the Santa Barbara area. And so she called me and asked if I would take her baby. And wow. she was like 35 weeks pregnant at the time. Wow. And like hadn't really, like didn't really even know if it was a boy or girl and just lots of um, things unknown at this point. So so she was going to have an appointment that week and find out some things and get back to us. And I was very cautious going into it. I think it felt all too good to be true. And like, how could this be happening to me? Like I'm getting two babies just like that without being on a list or paying some giant fee to an agency. I'm like this, there's gotta be a catch. Like, so I went into that cautiously, I think, cause it all just felt like way too easy, way too good to be true. Um, I also remember being concerned for the situation with my son who was foster status at the time because foster care placement can change depending on a significant change in circumstance in your home, which could be a baby, could be a divorce, could be, you know, whatever. Um, and so I was concerned that taking on another baby was going to affect his placement. And so I, I had to have that conversation with the caseworker. And I just remember telling her, like, she knew my story. She knew how bad I wanted a baby. She knew what we'd been through. Um, and I just said, you know, if this at all in any way is going to affect his placement, then I won't move forward. Not to say that I didn't want this other baby. I absolutely did. But he was bonded to us. He yeah. was our baby. I wasn't going to disrupt that crucial bonding time, nor did I want to send him to some stranger's house. Like he's my baby. <laughs> yes. And so in every sense, he was my baby and I was his mother and protector. And so I wasn't going to abandon that. And I knew that that could leave me empty handed. I knew that. And so she just, she had to talk to her supervisor and get like the okay to give me assurance that they were comfortable with us moving forward. 
So, and I think she even mentioned, because you're coming to me with these thoughts and you're willing to forego a for sure adoption for him, I see that he is in the best hands and he is where he should be. So we're going to keep him where he's at and you move forward with your adoption. So we did. So we, we went to California with him and my mom came to watch him in the hotel room while we went to the hospital. Um, while she was born and we got to be there and they brought her to us the minute that she was born, she was a C-section. And so we couldn't be in the room, um, because of numbers of people and everything. And so, um, they brought us to her before they even weighed her and did her APGAR test. They brought us back to the nursery doing skin to skin, um, and all that. So we got the full experience and then we were able to even have a room to ourselves for four days while birth mom recovered from her C-section because they won't release the baby until birth mom is discharged and able to sign papers without, you know, medication influencing her. So, um, anyway, so there was a time of waiting and holding our breath because she could change her mind at any time. And that was a whole other, like just roller coaster of a few days. But, um, we ended up leaving the hospital with her after four days and going to the hotel with our other baby. And I just remember that moment of like bringing them together and just like, I have this little video of them laying by each other and he's like this chunky little three, four month old baby. And she's just this tiny little bean wrapped in a swaddle. And they're just like, it's the first time they met. And, and then since then, so they're three months apart and they've only ever known each other since that moment so they very much have a twin dynamic they're in the same class they're in first grade and they're just lost without each other and like he's white and she's african-american but they tell people they're twins (laughs) they know that they're not twins they know i'm very open with them about adoption and where they came from and they know their birth mother's name and they know what they look like um very open about that but they like to lovingly say that they're adopted twins and they even share an adopted and their anniversary is their adoptiversary is the same day we were able to get it on the same day so anyway it's just cute but they're like my twins even though they're obviously not twins but um, i love i love that so that was a whole like you did something really bad I think you did something really powerful. And I think people who adopt kids, and I've seen this, and maybe the stigma isn't still there. I didn't do this with um, my child who we got from birth. That's I only got one child from birth. My other kids came in later in life. But I talked to them from the very beginning. You said they know their, you know, where they came from, how they joined your family what their birth parents' names are. All the information has already been given to them. It's natural. It's been a normal conversation. It's not this sticker shop that you hear in the past. Um, My niece, I don't believe they told her she was adopted until she was 12 years old. And I was thinking, you cannot do this to this child. That, that That is such a sticker shock such a moment of and now she's entering into puberty but if you have the conversation i really encourage people who are going through the adoption process you're bringing in a child this way that there is not a stigma attached because you got your child through this this way it's just it, adoption is just another way to bring your child into your home it doesn't matter if you give birth or if it's foster care or if it's adoption or stepchild when they come into your home that's what matters it doesn't matter how they get there um and so for you to have that conversation already and to make it natural and to make it flow but yet for them to realize, but there is this bond, there is this connection, there is this oneness with this union because they've always been one. And I know you've raised them just like that. They are connected and it's undeniable. And so I love that they're two 
different genders and two different um, ethnicities, but they are still so connected because none of that matters when it comes to love. Yeah. I think that's the theme. Yeah. It's just, it comes down to that. I think yeah. you said it so beautifully in the beginning. It's just all about love. Love is love. Yeah. Yep. So I don't know. It's been an interesting journey to watch them together as adopted twins. And I'm so glad they have each other. And as they grow, they'll have that to relate to each other and talk about things together as they feel different things. And, um, you know, it's funny. My So, so I'll rewind a little bit when, so then when they were, six months she was six months he was nine months old we we're just getting ready to finalize adoptions and i wake up one morning sick to my stomach and <laughs> i'm like gosh this feeling sure feels familiar but i've only been pregnant from in vitro so there's no chance sure enough i take a test and it's positive as positive as it can possibly be. And I just sat there in shock. Like I have these two babies crawling around on the floor, not even walking yet. And I'm pregnant <laughs> after all that, I just get pregnant. <laughs> and they warned me, they said, you know, now that you're adopting, you're going to get pregnant. I'm like, there's no chance. Like my body is <laughs> a barren wasteland. It's not going to get pregnant. <laughs> and so uh, sure enough, so now Sawyer, my son, my five-year-old, he is um, 13 months younger than her. So um, they are just like this little trio. Like they're twins. They're definitely like the twins. And he's sort of their sidekick that sometimes is like part of the trio. And then sometimes he's like, okay, to do his own thing. But back to like the adoption, like verbiage and just like, the feelings we give words. Yes. Um, I've always talked so highly of adoption. You know, like there's families who joke around with their biological siblings. Well, you're the adopted one. And, you know, yeah. like there's like some stigma around it, I think, in like older times. Yes. But I think like a lot of people are using new words like you were not given up for adoption, you're placed for adoption. Your birth mother chose this out of love. She didn't give up on you. She chose it selflessly out of love. You know, like dancing around that conversation with the right positive words because words are powerful and they hold meaning for us, like we were saying before. Yes. Um, and so I've been so open and positive and like, expressing my love for the birth moms and how lucky I am that they chose me to be their mom. And so um, my son, my biological son, hears all of this and he's so close to them and feels like such a part of them. But because he's number three and he's the only one not adopted of that trio, he feels left out because he's not adopted. <laughs> so... <gasps> He will say things like, why did I not get to be adopted? And why are they adopted? And I'm not. And it's so it's <laughs> I, I obviously think he doesn't quite comprehend what that actually would mean. But um, but to me, it's a compliment that I've spoke so highly of adoption to my other two that it's that it's so positively viewed. Yes. And well esteemed that my biological son wishes he could have been adopted. So he feels left out. <laughs> so. Oh my anyway. gosh. You, you put the whole twist on taking that word from a negative to a positive. And yeah, he doesn't understand, but that is such a, a powerful lens that you've placed in their life that it is, it is only a gift and that's it. And changing those labels in those terms is the simplest things, but when you do that, it changes the lens, it changes the landscape, and it just levels everything to where it is even instead of this uneven playing field that was so unhealthy in the past. I mean, it really, really right. was. And it, I don't yeah. see it that way anymore. I really feel like people are being very mindful 
and intentional on how they have conversations. And so I hope people are, when they're sitting in that spot, that they just embrace this with the positive um, notions that it deserves. You know, I mean, that's all you did. You layered it with love and you had open conversations and that's all you yeah. need to do because it doesn't matter the circumstance. It just matters that they was given with love and received with love. Yes. And it's, it's interesting because I think being a stepmom prepared me to be an adoptive mom um. because I had to already be in this space of you didn't grow in my body and you, there is a whole story about you before me. Yeah. Even though I got them as newborns, there's still a whole story of their birth mother and their, the, their family of origin and how they came to be and, and honoring that even as they're growing now, even though I've had them since birth, but it's amazing the conversations that, my, that I've had with them already that I, I didn't think I would have till they were teenagers, but yes. they're very intelligent, emotionally intelligent children who ask me big questions. <laughs> so anyway, but just recognizing what came before you and loving where they came from and honoring where they came from. So, and the trauma that came from that and, you know, because even getting a newborn, they still experience trauma because yeah. being removed from your biological mom, no matter what stage you're at is traumatic. So yes, recognizing that and all of that. So anyway, I do think being a stepmom prepared me for that and you know, prepares me for maybe the teenagers that might say, you're not my real mom. <laughs> it's okay. I can take it. But, um, you know, but I just feel really lucky to have that perspective because I do think it prepared me to be a better adoptive mom. And likewise, I think losing a baby, you know, like, I know what it's like to leave the hospital without your baby. Mm. And I know what it's like to wonder how your baby's doing and what they might look like and how they might, what they're like. And so I think because of that, I chose to have an open adoption with both birth moms um, just because of my perspective. And I think it's healthier emotionally for my children to have that, um, to just have open dialogue about it. Um, both situations are different, but, and as they get older and I'm sure that dynamics will change, but as of right now, I, I have, we text, they follow me on social media and they get to just see my stories and watch kids growing up and they get a little window into their world. And, and I know that especially my son's birth mom just, loves that so yes so yeah but. i think that perspective and i didn't realize because i've had a i've had several miscarriages i've had six miscarriages and my one that i carried the furthest was 18 and a half weeks when i lost what i believe was a little girl but you do get that perspective like you do leave the hospital with these I didn't get a box, but with these empty boxes and these things that don't get filled. And so you're really mindful when I stepped into that place with my daughter, we adopted from birth. So I'm glad that you brought that perspective up because I think it does change your lens. You're like, why would I take this away? Because my philosophy, eliminate a problem before it is a problem. Well, this would hurt their heart. As a mother, you ran to your child's grave and you covered it up because to protect your child, that feeling doesn't go away because they placed this child in somebody else's arm. They still want to know that their child is protected and having good memories and creating the childhood that they envision, even if it's not in their presence. And so for you to give them that right. gift, to be open and to be mindful, 
I think all of these things, like you said, being a step parents, going through this experience with your daughter Blythe, and then one situation leading to another and to another. And now, you know, since Sawyer, you had another daughter and now you are having a surprise. We don't know what it is. We're holding off. We didn't do the big gender <laughs> reveal with this one, but everything no. lends to the next step. And if we allow ourselves to see that, then the possibilities and the path just seems to flow so much better. And I've seen that in your life, like, oh, this was really challenging. It was really overwhelming. This season was dark and hard. Yes, it was. But all of a sudden these doors open, you're like, oh my gosh, but look where I ended up. And because of this experience and this experience, we talk about this all the time, you're young, but you have so much wisdom and knowledge because you raised these older children and now how it is influencing you when now you're raising the younger ones that you didn't have that experience with the bonus ones, but now you're getting to have this. And so it does change your lens. It's changed your lens, not just for motherhood. I know this experience that you've gone through, it has changed your lens with your identity. It has changed your lens with your marriage. It has changed your lens with your religion. It has changed your lens with your values. And those kind of things, I think, are such exquisite gifts that life gives us. Often I hear people talk about things like this. It's, it was a crisis. No, it wasn't a crisis. It's a beautiful a, awakening, this arising in you, going back to this knowing that is so true that you cannot deny it. And every layer that I see that I walk through you and with you on your path is just led you to this space of like you're blooming. In my eyes, I feel like you're really coming into this season of just blooming. And this last child yeah. is just like the little sprinkles on top. It's a little, a little cherry on top. <laughs> yeah, it's the little bow around the bouquet. Yeah. It's putting it in the beautiful crystal vase. Yeah. I feel like that's yeah. really where you are right now because it's just, it's yeah. incredibly powerful to watch you transcend each of these seasons in each of these stages. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, it's been a journey. <laughs> what's next? That's what uh, I'm going to have to have you come back and we're going to have to do what's next. Cause we just scratched the surface um, and really just kind of, yeah, I, I feel like we need to do, I think, I Go think ahead. I'm going to invite you back and we're going to do segments um, because I feel like our conversation yeah. and so many things have come up that people can relate to and that people are not having conversations about. We need to be open yeah. and and have dialogue and not put anything in a box anymore and open it up so everyone can see the true lens in which it is. Because it is just lead with love. Yeah. Love is love. Love is love, yeah. Yeah, I feel like lots of things we talked about could be their own like episode. Adoption and fertility, baby loss, blending families, step parenting, all of that. Just religion, <laughs> lots of things. <laughs> well, I, yes. Well, I wanted to bring you on. I wanted everyone to get to know you, to get to know us, and then bring you back. And we're going to dive into each one of those areas and really foster some really good conversations. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share about your journey and what you've been through and where you're landing right now? Because you are weeks away of bringing another little beautiful <laughs> human into the world. What are your final thoughts? Oh, coming so fast. I'm like, it's funny after you've had a few, you kind of like don't really do the countdown as much. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I guess... I guess it's time to start getting ready for a baby. <laughs> it's kind of Once where I'm at now. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I just, um, life is interesting. You think you have a plan. I've always been like a very planning person. I have like my plan and then it never goes to plan. 
<laughs> and I've learned over the years to just throw the plan in the garbage, at least have an idea of where you'd like to go, but be open to the possibility of change and, and opening up to um, whatever the universe is going to bring you. Keeping an open mind and just love and um, I think setting aside your picture of what you thought life was supposed to be or what you thought it should be. Um, I think that if you open yourself up to possibilities that it can be more beautiful than anything you could have ever planned for yourself. So very well said. Yeah. And I agree with you. We need to be open to change because we are designed. Oh, I lost you. Oh, you're back for a moment. You, you glitched out, but we are designed for change and we allow the universe or God, or the energies, whatever you believe in, to guide us, we are going to land down a path that was designed even better than what we could imagine. Yes, we have our intention yeah. and to be intentional and have mindset about where we want to go, but also allowing something bigger than us, the universe, to come in and to open up doors of new possibilities and I think that's where the beauty lies in. And I really appreciate you taking time to share that. I hope people can see that in their own lives. And I end every podcast this way. You can't go over it. Natalie showed us that today. You definitely can't go under it. <laughs> you have to go through it. And let's just go through it together. Yeah. And today, let's go through it with love. Carry on. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. It's a pleasure.